is great to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? God says for two, where two or three people gather in his name, he'll be there. We would like to welcome all of you wherever you are, whether you're here at the sanctuary or however you're tuning in. Thank you for joining us today in Central Study Hour. God has been faithful to us in every season, and we should praise His name for His goodness, His mercies, and also His mighty power. Let's sing a song with title, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, as the hymnal number 88. Let's sing all verses. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present there. What a mighty God we have. I would like to invite you to send a hymn request so we can sing together in the next Central Study Hour. Please visit our website at saccentral.org, click the contact us, then scroll down to CSH hymn request. Let us know your name, where you're from. Your email address and also the title of the hymn will be happy to sing your hymn request on the upcoming Sabbath. The title of the study, our lesson today is The Source of Life. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said that He is the way, He is the truth, and He is also the life. And if we want to be saved by His grace, we have to follow His way, receive His truth, that way his life becomes our life. Let's sing a song with title, Because He Lives, as the hymnal number 526. Let's sing all verses.
Life is worth the living just because He lives. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to have you, the mighty Lord. Thank you for dying for us, Lord, because of you that we may live and we have our future. Lord, at this moment, please be with us. Open our hearts so we can understand your truth. Bless Pastor Mike, who will share your words today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Central Study Hour today will be presented by Pastor Mike Thompson, lesson number nine, The Source of Life. I hope you have a blessed study. Well, greetings everyone and welcome to another edition of Central Study Hour. Uh, those of you who are here in the audience and those of you who are looking in from somewhere on the planet, we're glad to welcome you again as usual. Now, before we begin, I want to just remind you, you can have a free CD or a DVD of today's presentation. Make a note of this. It's offer number C202448, 202448. And you should know the number by now. It's 916-457-6511. And of course, the email address is csh at saccentral.org. And we'll repeat that again at the end today. So yes, we're on lesson number nine already, the source of life. Uh, there's a memory verse here. It's from John 14, verse six. Jesus is speaking here and he says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And how true that is. Jesus is our great high priest. He's our mediator. He's the author of life, and we'll be looking at that. But unless we have him also as our mediator, we cannot have access to God's throne of grace and mercy. We cannot receive the Holy Spirit and there's no way we could receive eternal life. So, John 14, verse 6. At the introduction part here on Sabbath afternoon, uh, I'm going to read part of this here. It says, in the Gospel of John, when asked who he was, Jesus answered with the term that designates deity. He simply said, I am. Well, you know, there were scribes and Pharisees around when he used this term, and he didn't use it glibly. They understood exactly what that meant. It was a term for God Almighty. Now, people in the crowd, they may not have gotten that, but those who knew absolutely understood what he was saying here. And as you can imagine, they were just totally aghast, but Jesus was speaking the truth. He is who he is. He says, I am what I am, and he always will be what he will be. He's God Almighty, one with the Father. Uh, and it was also Jesus. Uh, I am was the unmistakable reference that uh, when, when Moses was at the burning bush, remember that? He was tending his sheep, and he saw the burning bush, and he went over there, and, and he was amazed that the bush wasn't being burned. You know the story, he heard the voice say, take off your shoes, for you're on holy ground, and the Lord told him, Go back to Egypt, bring my people out. And he says, what do I tell them? Who sent me? And God said, and by the way, let's never forget, this was Jesus in his pre-incarnate form that met with Moses at the burning bush. And remember, Jesus said to him, tell them, I am has sent me. God Almighty, Jesus Christ. 
And uh, we know this same God, the I am, then became flesh and dwelt among us. This is from John chapter 1, verse 14. The I am then became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. This is John speaking. He said, we actually beheld his glory. A lot of people beheld Jesus' glory, but John also is referencing the fact that when he, Peter, James, and John, saw the glory of Christ when they were up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter also pre, uh, wrote of this in one of his epistles. He said, we, we saw his glory we, up on the Mount. He actually specifies the place. So they saw that glory, which occasionally just kind of shone forth from this common-looking carpenter come itinerant preacher from uh, Galilee. And it says, He became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And it continues, the theme I am is threaded all throughout John. And uh, it says this memory verse, which we've just looked at here. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, I am. The I am is the light of the world, the bread of life, the gate or the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, and the true vine, and many other terms through which symbolically we speak about Jesus himself. And so the last little paragraph there, last sentence on Sabbath afternoon, it's an intro to what we're going to look at. This week continues with the revelation of God as given us in John we will also more fully explore the flip side of things in which, despite of the powerful evidence for Jesus as the Messiah, some, if not many, rejected him. We will study this idea for two reasons. Number one, to avoid the same mistake. But number two, to also consider how we might be able to reach out to those in danger of making that mistake as well. Uh, the devil works in so many ways to um, distract people, and we have to be careful ourselves. We're so easily distracted. He distracts, he deludes, he deceives. He has so, and his skill to deceive, I think it's in, um, I don't think it's in Desire of Ages, but there is a statement in the prophecy, uh, in Spirit of Prophecy, that says, since the time of Christ, Satan is ten times more, he's polished his ability, he's refined his art, ten times more than in the time of Christ to deceive and to delude human beings. So what what should this tell us? That more than ever before, we need to understand what this word is saying. We need to take every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Otherwise, and we can't pick and choose, and the devil would be happy for us to read the Bible if we pick and choose certain ones and take verses out of context. He's got deceptions for people who do that. We cannot afford to stray off the track. Everything that's written in the word about Jesus, we need to accept. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to Sunday. In him, in the great I am, in him was life. Uh, I want to read the top paragraph. It's from uh, John chapter 1. It says, uh, or it's referencing that. The apostle clearly states that Jesus is God, the divine son. Consequently, in John 1, 4, it says this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. His life and his light. The reference to life here has to be divine life, underived, eternal, self-existent. Because he has life within himself, he can lay down his life, and he can take his life back again. And John, uh, Jesus made this very clear in John 10, verse 17. And continuing, and because he has life within, he can give life to whom he will. Now, the Greek word for life is zoe. And about 36 uh, times in the New Testament, we find this term used for life, zoe, the actual Greek word. 
And there's a number of times uh, we, we can look as we, as we study the context that it's speaking of Jesus giving biological life. Sure, he can do that. He's the creator. He was the one. Uh, through him everything was made, and without him was not anything made. So he can give biological life, and that's a wonderful thing. But the majority of these verses in the Greek, which speak, use the term zoe. They're speaking, referring to the fact that Jesus is the author and the giver of eternal life. Biological life is great. Hey, praise the Lord. That's a miracle in itself. But only he, only he can give eternal life. Um, just an amazing thing. Uh, near the bottom of the second paragraph there, um, it says that he is the one that brings salvation and eternal life to a lost world. And there's a verse reference there, John 10, 27 and 28. Jesus is my sheep, hear my voice, and I know them. He knows us all individually. I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them, what does he give them? That's right, eternal life. And they shall never perish. And this is why Jesus is not just the author of eternal life, but because of Adam's great failure, as human beings, we lost. We lost eternal life. But the purpose of Jesus coming to this earth and becoming one of us was to make available to us again this wonderful miracle of eternal life. And there's, uh, there's several verses in here uh, under that second paragraph that I want us to uh, look at. And it explains very clearly why Jesus came to this earth. Uh, John uh, 10, uh, 10. Uh, it says, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And then we've got John 12, 27. Jesus said, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? This is when he's getting close to his Gethsemane experience. He says, now is my soul, soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no, because it was for this cause, Jesus said, that I came into the world. To die as a sacrifice for every man, woman, and child, and through my sacrifice, as they come to me just as they are, they can receive forgiveness, they can receive mercy, and they can receive that which was lost through Adam's terrible uh, failure, they can have eternal, eternal life. And so he said, I'm sorrowful, but he said, this is why I'm here. Then, of course, we have John 3.16. Everybody knows this well, do we not? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I just, wanna, I just wanna, want us to notice something there. There's two things here contrasted through Jesus. We can have everlasting life or we can perish. It's the, it's, the, it's the term perish I want us just to consider for a moment. You know, uh, some people have the idea that we are born with an immortal soul. And that soul, if we accept Jesus, we're, we, we can live eternally in our immortal soul. Conversely, they believe even if you're lost, you still have an immortal soul and you will go on forever and ever and ever because you're immortal burning in the fires of hell. That is not true. That is not what the scripture teaches. This is based on dualism, and it comes from the ancient Greeks, the immortal soul thing, but it's found its way into Christianity. So I just wanted to mention that in passing. And, and Jesus said very clearly, very clearly, either we, ha in John 3, 16, um, that he believes in me should not perish, you look at the term perish in the Greek, it doesn't mean suffering in hell, it means to be destroyed completely. So it's eternal extinction compared to eternal life 
with Jesus Christ. Just thought I would throw that in there. Then we got John 6:40. Everyone that believes on the Son may have eternal life. Praise God. Praise God. I want to add something else as well, because uh, you've heard of cheap grace. It's certainly out there. It's been doing the rounds for a very long, long time. And uh, there's a lot of people believe that all you have to do, you just believe. You just believe in Jesus, and you are home and dry. You have eternal life. Well, in 1 John uh, chapter 5, there's a... Um, Let's see how many, I want to read five verses here. This is not in the lesson, but I do want to bring it in here. Because to believe, there's not just an intellectual assent. There's more to it than that. Just follow these verses with me. 1 John 5, beginning at verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, okay, we've got to believe, but notice what else it says, is born of God. We need to believe in him, yes, but we also have to have the new birth. We need to be born again. And John, uh, Jesus himself said in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, he said, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We need the Holy Spirit to give us that spiritual perception and insight. But he also said as well, except a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of God. So belief has its place. But there's, there's more to it than that. We have to be born of God and born again. And uh, verse 3. Uh, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Oh, so we believe in him. We, we confess our sins. We ask forgiveness. We open our hearts. Jesus forgives us. And we're born again. And the new covenant promises, in actual fact, this was even in the, under the old covenant promise. It's all really the same thing. Um, that under the new covenant promise, God has promised through the Holy Spirit to write his law upon the tables of our hearts. In other words, the Spirit will empower us to keep God's law. Well, that's more than just believing, as a lot of people are taught to just believe. Just believe. No, there's more to it than that. And then verse 4, it says, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Some people, they become Christians. You know, they, they believe and they just go out in the world and they drink like the world and they eat like the world and they, they have entertainment like the world. They, they, their lives don't change. But to believe means also as well to separate oneself from the world and overcome through that born-again experience to be victorious Christians. And uh, verse 5 sums it up. And who is he that overcomes the world but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So this little passage, we've got bookends. The first book end, verse 1, is you believe in Christ. And the last verse, verse 5, it's got the other book end, you believe in the Son of God. But in between, there's other elements that are involved in having a born-again and viable Christian experience where you can be sure that you do have eternal life. Uh, getting back to the lesson, the third paragraph, uh, there's a verse there from John 3, 14 and 15. Um, Jesus speaking, he says, and he's talking to Nicodemus. He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him, there it is again, should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus there, he was speaking of him being lifted up on a cross. And you know, when you go to that quiet place where you commune with God and you spend that time contemplating the cross and you see in the mind's eye through faith the price that was paid for your redemption, as we behold that love, it will draw us to him. And that love, soft as it is, and wonderful as it woozes, is a powerful force to change the most hardened 
heart. The, the love of God is just an incredible, incredible thing here. Well, I, I need to move on to uh, Monday. The words of eternal life. There's a question at the top of Monday. It said, when Jesus asked the disciples if they would leave him, what was the meaning of Peter's answer? Well, uh, let's go to John 6, uh, verse um, 61. We read these words. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Uh, the context here, we had this in a previous lesson. Um, Jesus had fed the 5,000. He gathered a following of people. They thought, this is great. <clears throat> He's going to be... He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to break off the Roman yoke. And look, he can feed us. Oh, this is going to be just a wonderful experience. But Jesus had a word, a few words to tell to them. He says, look, he made it clear in, un, in no uncertainty. He was not there to be a king. His kingdom was not of this world. He made that clear in other places as well. And uh, he used the analogy of eating his body and drinking his blood applying the bread and the grape juice to his life, to his body and his blood. And um, um, they, they weren't looking for words like that. They didn't want these spiritual platitudes. They wanted him to say, hey, guys, I'm, go I'm going to break off the Roman wing. I I'm going to be the reincarnation of David. They, they didn't like these things that Jesus was speaking of. Uh, and so um, he said to them, he says, does this offend you? He knew what they were thinking. And in verse 32, he, uh, well, let me go to verse 63, sorry. He said, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profits nothing. He's contrasting here the spiritual with the physical. The physical bread, yeah, bread, yeah, sure, you know, it, it does you some good. But he was speaking about the spiritual. The physical is transient. He says, it's the spirit that brings life, eternal life. The fresh, the transient bread you eat at one meal, it's okay, but it cannot give you eternal life. And then he said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And then he knew very well what was going on. He said in the next verse, but there are some of you that believe not. And it says, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Well, some of these who were following him, some of those when he was on trial who cried out when uh, Pilate says, what shall we do with him? What did they say? They said, crucify him. You can be sure that some of those he'd actually fed or seen his miracles. Uh, they were some of the very ones that clamored for his life. Then in verse 66, we read these very sad words. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back. This is not the 12. There was a whole bunch of them, followers, disciples. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Verse 67. And I would love to have heard the way that Jesus asked his disciples this question. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, will you also, will you also go away? Well, there was an answer, wasn't there? And who gave the answer? Well, it was our good friend Peter. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We well, you know our good old friend Peter, he got some things wrong. He could blunder sometimes, and he did. But he had it absolutely right this time. He said, Lord, who, who, who can we go to? He said, we believe that you are the Son of God. We believe that you are the Master. We believe that you have eternal life. And I say, good for you, good for you, Peter. He, un he understood that. Now, um, and I, I don't have time to read from Desire of Ages because this actually was 
in a previous lesson that, that I did on this very spot, but there's a paragraph there in Desire of Ages, I forget the page, where Ellen White speaks about this moment as Jesus saw these people leaving him. And I made a point when I was um, teaching that lesson, you know, rejection. Rejection is a hard thing. And uh, it wounded the heart of Jesus to see these people turn away and walk with him no more. We can be so easily hurt. And our hearts are pretty hard, but we can be so easily hurt. But Jesus' heart, his sensitivities were so acute that if we saw all our friends leave us, it would, we'd be heartbroken. But his, his sensitivities were far more acute. And imagine what that did to him. It would just wring his heart. It would break his heart when people turned away from him. Not so much because it grieved him to be rejected, though it pained him, but it grieved him at heart because he knew this person was walking away from the only source of eternal life, and it just tore his heart up to think that this person would be eternally lost. So if he's talking to you and he's calling you to follow him, don't break his heart and turn away. Go to him. Let him have your heart. You'll bring him such tremendous joy. Okay, moving on here. Um, we're talking about everlasting life. Um, it says in the lesson, the phrase everlasting life or its equivalent occurs about 17 times in the Gospel of John. And it doesn't just refer to a spirit existence or to becoming part of an eternal being or some other ethereal concept. Rather, it deals with the, with the fact that when when we die, and when Jesus resurrects us to eternal life, we will have real bodies. It will be the restoration of what, what, of what Adam lost in Eden. When Adam was created, God made him from the dust. He made him with flesh and blood. He breathed into him. He had a real heart. He had blood. He, he needed food to eat. He needed water to drink. That will be, if you like, the dimension that will be, that we will have again. We will not be little wispy spirits floating around on clouds playing harps in heaven. Absolutely, that could get boring after a time, just floating on a cloud. We will have real bodies, we'll be in a real place, we will be in Eden restored in the new earth. We will have our work to do, so it's going to be a real life experience, nothing ethereal. Okay, so how do we receive this eternal life? Well, we've already spoken about that. But um, partway down there, that's the question, how do we receive eternal life? There's some verses there. Uh, John 8, 3, it says, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, so the word, we, we find the way to eternal life in the word of God. In this word, it says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. We need the word of God to guide us, and God has given us his word to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so when Jesus has said something to us from his word or any of the prophets, and we hear that, we accept it, we need to continue in that. Even if it goes against the grain and it's something, well, I don't, I don't feel inclined to do that because it's going to require me to give up this little pet idol here, do it. Whatever it costs, do it. Continue in the word that God has made clear to your understanding. And then John 12, 46 Jesus speaking again, he says, whoever believes on me uh, should not abide in darkness. We've got light and we've got darkness. And I'm going to say a little bit more about light and darkness, um, I think, in the next, uh, in the next uh, page here. But whoever believes on me will not abide in we, we Naturally, we abide in darkness, spiritual darkness. We may, you know, we, we may love a, just a real rave. We go downtown on a whatever night of the week and we, we see the lights, we go in the bars, we go in the casinos, and you ask, you, the idea that you're walking in dark, absolutely no, man, I'm in the lights. Wow, this is, this is living, this is light. That actually is being in the darkest, darkest place you could ever be. That is the darkness we should not go into. The light that God calls us into is a true light. It's the light, the path that lights the way to eternal life. And then it moves on with these uh, verses here. Uh, I'm going to read the last one, John 6, uh, 40. It says, For everyone that believes on the Son may have eternal 
life. You remember, of course, you read there in 1 John um, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, okay, we need to believe, but we need to be born again, keep the commandments through the power of God. So let's just keep that in vogue here. But we're saved, along with that, by faith alone. We, 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 with the commandments, yeah, God, God writes his law upon our hearts and he empowers us to keep it. But again, we don't keep the law to be saved. We're not saved by our works. We're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. The works come as a consequence of having been saved by faith in Christ. The works come as a consequence of him coming, dwelling inside us. The works come as a consequence of being filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to keep the law. And the works... They are the evidence that our faith in Christ is true and genuine. In James, he says, show me your faith. He says, I'll show you my faith by my works. He says, because faith without works of the law is dead. The works are evidence that Christ dwells within and we are born again. So faith. It says, by faith alone, we believe that Jesus came to live and die in our behalf. This faith through us comes as a gift. It's all a gift. There's a little saying. Um, only by the grace of God can anything good be put into my life. And only by the grace of God can anything good come out of my life. In other words, it's all a work of divine grace from beginning to end. It's all, and all this is a gift from God. His grace is a gift, a tremendous, tremendous gift. Even the ability to repent. It's what God, it's a gift. God puts that inside us that gives us the ability to feel sorry. There's nothing that we can take credit for. In other words, you can't go to God feeling sorry for your sins and say, dear God, see, I've, I've made myself sorry. I've made myself sorry. No, you haven't. You don't have the ability to make yourself sorry. It's God that enables us to make, to enable us to feel sorry and to come and confess our sins. So, we, we can claim the forgiveness and the cleansing from sin that only Jesus himself can give to us. So if Jesus were to ask me or ask you or looking in or anybody who might be sitting in here, will you also go away? I know the answer I will give, and I trust it's the same you would give. And you folks out there, Lord, to whom can I go? You're the only one who can give me eternal life. And you say that even if everybody else walks away, and you will bring him such tremendous joy. Let's go to Tuesday, believing and the new birth. It says, what are the steps described here about becoming a Christian? Well, we've, we've, we've gone through some of these steps already, but let's still read it. We're in John chapter 1 and verses 12 and 13. John 1. 12 and 13. Here we are. This is the introduction, part of the introduction of John. It says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, again, born again, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, these steps are a little bit jumbled up. I want to set them in order here. Um, number one is, where is number one gone? Okay, it is, um, we believe on his name. Okay, that's true. Then uh, number two, we confess our sins, of course. Point number two, we receive him. We receive him into our lives. Point number three, he gives us power to become the sons and daughters of God. And we are born, number four, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Those steps, again, they're all right there for us, to, uh, for us to look at. Now, again, I want to say this, both the desire to believe in the first place, God gives us the ability to believe, gives us the ability to exercise faith through the Holy Spirit who speaks to us directly and especially through His Word. And the, the second paragraph down uh, it says, in fact, faith itself is a gift of God. We, 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 we understand that. That comes by hearing his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's there in Romans. But there's a little statement from uh, the book Education from Ellen White. In order to have true abiding faith in Christ, we must know him as he is presented or represented in the 
the word, Fundamentals of Christian Education. And then there's another one from Ellen White. Uh, the spirit operating upon and enlightening the human mind creates faith in God. Okay, going down to, uh, there's a verse there from Romans. It says, what principle about salvation in Jesus is found here? It cites Romans chapter 8, verse 16, but I want to read Romans 8, verses 14 through 16. I want to just add a little bit more to this here. Romans 8 is a very powerful, powerful chapter. Sorry, I'm not in it. It's here. Romans chapter 8, verses... Excuse me. Verses 14 through 16. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Then verse 16, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are are the children of God. Tuesdays, believing and the new birth. This is what we're looking at here. When a person is born again and they receive the Holy Spirit, we have that assurance inside. It says very clearly that the Spirit that God gives us bear witness, bears witness with our little spirit, not a Holy Spirit, but our spiritual aspect of our being, bears witness with our conscience that we are the sons and daughters of God. You have that assurance I know, I know that I am a child of God. And every morning when you go in your prayer closet, you need to stay there till you know you've given your life, you know you've surrendered, you know that Jesus is in your heart, you know that the Holy Spirit has written His law there, you know you've received Christ through the Spirit, and you have that assurance. And it says we receive the Spirit of adoption. And further on there in Romans chapter 8, it says, you receive the Spirit adoption, and we know the Spirit confirms in us that we are the children of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ to the kingdom of glory. First promise to Abraham, fulfilled through Abraham's seed, which was Christ, one of his seed. He became human with us, and through Christ, as the Son of God, he paid the price for our redemption. He paid the price for that kingdom that was lost through Adam to be redeemed and restored. It was the Son of God. And as the Son of Man, one with us, he inherits it. So this is why we become joint heirs with Christ. This is why in Revelation 3, it says, You will sit down with me on my throne. He shares the throne with us of the kingdom of glory. It's just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Okay, um, all right, I think I will move on to uh, Wednesday here. There's more we could say that. Let me just have a look here a moment. Um, yeah, the, the last paragraph, let, let, me, um, let me look at this. It says, faith, biblical faith, based on the work of the Holy Spirit in our heart, is the foundation of our faith. Faith is a great blessing. The eye that sees, the ear that hears. That's from uh, Heavenly Places by Ellen, Ellen White. The humanistic approach to faith states that we must find a foundation, the criteria for faith, and then believe. In contrast, the biblical approach states that faith is the foundation, a gift from God. We start with the foundation of faith, and from there we grow in our understanding and our grace. There's a question at the bottom there. If someone were to, someone were to ask you what your faith is based on, how would you respond? How would I respond? Well, I would put it very simply. Uh, the, what was the question again? My faith is based on not mythology, not theories, not human ideas. My faith is based upon a person that I know actually exists. My faith is based on Jesus Christ, and my faith is based on this word, the word of Jesus Christ, and I can tell people this, I have no reason to change what I believe in because Jesus never changes and his word never changes. The world changes all the time, customs and habits, fashions, they come and they go, and people just are dragged along with them like dead fish going with the tide. But this word and the author, Jesus Christ, is immovable, unchangeable, and that is the basis of my faith in him. 
Okay, Wednesday. Well, this kind of has some sad overtones here. Rejecting the source of life. Who would want to reject? But we've already seen. Many of the disciples turned away and walked with him no more because they don't see the value. They don't see the truth. It has no appeal to them because Satan darkens their minds and darkens their eyes. Let me read the top paragraph. Some of the saddest accounts in all of Scripture occur in the Gospel of John. It says uh, in John uh, chapter 1, verse 5, 10, and 11, it's a contracted uh, version of three verses here. It says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The light was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Can you credit that? He was the light, came down to become the light of this world, and yet the world by choice, uh, you know, it's by choice. They didn't want to know him, and it really hasn't changed. But for you looking in, and for us here, it has changed, praise God. And make sure that you stand definitely remaining on that foundation of Jesus Christ, unchangeable Christ, and unchangeable, and you will be fine. But this world needs to hear this truth, and this is why, few in number as we are, we have to be the ones that step forward and say, Lord, we need to let, I want to lay down this, lay, I want to lay down this and be a missionary for you and take this message out to this world. If I don't do it, others will, because you read in Revelation, Revelation 14, the third angel's message, if we don't take it out, others, others will. So let's be a part of that. But nonetheless, the fact that people would just, just reject them. And this was all amazing in the light of the miracles uh, that Jesus did even to the point of raising the dead. He raised Lazarus' daughter, he, the widow of Nain. He, he raised her son. People saw that. And of course, Lazarus, he even raised Lazarus from, from the dead. And yet, in spite of that, the Jews, the leadership, the hierarchy, they were all the more determined to kill Christ. And also Lazarus, who was the one who'd been raised from the dead. Is that insanity? Absolutely is. But they thought they were on the even keel. Why? Because they had rejected the source of life, and bit by bit, if not more quickly than that, they'd gone into a state of spiritual darkness and delusion. And, this, and Satan is a master of taking the mind and dimming the light till finally it's in darkness and the people think they're still in the light. Maybe with some even greater ideas but they're deluded, they're blind, and they're lost. And yet, in spite of these miracles, they rejected Jesus, and it wasn't really because of what he did. It was because of what he said. Uh, there's a statement in uh, Wednesday, which I will read. It's from um, uh, Edward Zinke and Roland Hegstad. It's from a, a writing, The Certainty of the Second Coming. And uh, it reads as follows. The contemporary humanistic way of thinking begins with doubt. People question everything in order to determine what is truth. And, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But you still have to have a mind that's open to when you do find the truth. And if you're asking God to lead you to the truth, he will do that. So, yes, we just can't take anything. The devil can appear as an angel of light. So, of course, we're not going to just run into his open arms and accept anything. But anyway, so just putting that in context here. Um, that which su survives the fire of cross-examination, they accept as rock-solid knowledge, something on which to place one's faith. Some apply the same method to the Bible, calling everything into question from a scientific historical, psychological, philosophical, archaeological, or geological perspective in order to determine what is the truth of the Bible. Well, you know, and let me finish this, then I can comment on it. Uh, the very method itself starts with and builds upon doubt in the veracity of Scripture. That's where they start from, and they think that's the place to start. Christ asked, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? Good question. He will, 
but with a lot he won't. When they had the light, they had the knowledge, they had the truth, they had all the opportunity necessary. But let's take an example of what we see today in the, in the area of science. Here's the word of God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Well, if you're highly educated and you've been to some of these renowned uh, colleges or universities, and uh, you're in with the, this set, this mindset, that, uh, no, we're above the superstition of Scripture. We're real scientists, so we're going to apply the scientific knowledge that we have, and we will surely show and prove that this world was not made in six days. This world evolved over a long period of time. Well, two things I want to mention about this. First one is, when you examine the evidences in the geological strata in the rocks, and other places, you will find forms of life in the, what, what we are told was uh, way, 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 way back. These forms that we found are not supposed to be there. They're supposed to be up here. You find these things. There is geological evidence of a worldwide flood, but these things are ignored. I'll, let me say this really quick. When Mount St. Helens erupted, it took a few years, but there were layers of sediment that were laid down. And... Uh, the rain came and stuff, and so these gullies were cut, these little canyons were cut. And uh, if you walk there today, where the, where, the sediment, where the sediment is, it, you can see layers on a smaller scale, like a, a mini Grand Canyon. And you would swear that this looks like, as the, as the evolutionists tell us, that this was laid down 30 million years ago. It wasn't. It was laid down within the last 40 years. Uh, there's a series of DVDs. It's called, Is Genesis History? And uh, so Google this, Is Genesis History? And Google search Del Tackett, Tackett, and you'll find these videos, and they're really, really good. But the second point I want to make is this. If we are determined to go and look at the geological strata or whatever else we want to look at, because we want to, we want to poo-poo the word of God, if you will, God won't work any miracles to change our minds. He will leave us with our delusions that we love and our minds will finally become so absolutely twisted, we'll think we're in the light, we're in abject darkness, we think we're, we're super, super, super intelligent, and what we are, we're just fools, waiting when Jesus comes to see how foolish we are to trust in these things and to reject the word, to reject the light, to reject Jesus, to reject the scientific statement. This is not a science book, but what it says, when it refers to science, geology, genealogies, biology, we need to believe it because it's absolutely true and correct. Okay, we don't want to reject uh, the light, eternal light. Let's go to Thursday, condemnation. I'm going to begin here by reading from John chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, and it's a contracted uh, version here. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whosoever lives by the truth comes into the light. It says in the word. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You might think a small choice to make, believe or not believe, but the consequences have eternal ramifications, and that certainly speaks for itself. But it's looking at different ways that condemnation comes uh, upon people. There's another one here from John 12, verse 47. It, Jesus said, if any man hear my words and believe not, I will judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. What this person actually does, they actually judge themselves. They bring condemn condemnation on themselves because <laughs> they don't believe. They reject it. Having said that, we know that the Father has committed all judgment into the Son's hand, and one day in the executive judgment, it will be Christ on his throne, which will declare the sentence of eternal death upon the wicked. But during this part of his ministry, when he, came, he didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He came, he came indeed uh, to save. But in one way or another, 
Human beings can be so perverse in one way or another, people even today, as they have over the ages, we can come up with one reason or another to reject and bring condemnation upon ourselves. And here's the thing again. I mentioned before, Satan is ten times more able to deceive and delude as he was in the time of Jesus. If we turn away from the light, the devil's got so many other little light, shiny objects that he dances before people's eyes, and they're attracted to them. And it's just a, a lethal and a dangerous path for anybody to walk. He's got something for anything. And we look at Eve in the garden. God had told her plainly, don't eat the fruit. What did she do? Well, she didn't pluck it herself. The serpent plucked it. And you read Patriarchs and Prophets, he was actually eating it himself. So here he is. He's already drawn her onto the enchanted ground. She gets into a conversation with him. So he's able, if you will, to hypnotize her, if you will, and beguile her. Finally, what happens? She eats the fruit, and we know the rest of the story. So let us, let us, it behooves us to remember that Jesus is the light. He brought light. We have one life in which we can live to see that light. Don't reject it. Don't walk away from it. You have one life. I have one life in which to come to Jesus and listen to his words. And if they cross some favorite little thing that we don't want to do, don't be like the other disciples that walked away and walked with him no more. Accept what he says. It's the only way. It's the right way. And if we will just do what's right, we will live forevermore to appreciate that. Well, I'm glad you could join us today. Um, those of you looking in, let me just remind you, you can have a free uh, CD or a DVD of today's presentation. It's off a number C202448, C202448. Or you can call us at 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at saccentral.org. Good seeing you. God bless you. And by the grace of God, we'll see you next time.